This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling from. My name is Leah Mupasigi, and I'm a policy fellow with Geo Blue Planet. Um, today is our third session of our Earth Observations for Tuna Fisheries Management Workshop. Um, and our speakers today will be discussing improving sustainable management and biodiversity conservation through Earth Observation data. Um, so I, I thank our panelists for joining us today. I'm also joined by Emily Smale, who is the Executive Director of Geo Blue Planet, who will help out in case I have any technical difficulties. Um, and I do want to apologize for those who um, logged in an hour ago, or if you're watching this recording because you missed the presentation, um, I made a mistake on Eventbrite. So if you're here right now, thanks for joining. If not, thank you for watching the recording. Um, all of the recordings for our sessions, um, so I said this is session three, we have two more to go. All of our previous sessions will be available on our website, geoblueplanet.org slash eofortuna. Um, and I hope you could join the next two sessions. So now I will welcome our first presenter, Dr. Manu Tuporusen. I will first stop sharing my screen. And make her a presenter. Right. Dr. Manu Tupurusen was unanimously appointed by the Foreign Fisheries Agency's Fisheries Ministers to the role of Director General and commenced in mid November 2018. And she is the first woman to assume this role. She has a Master's of Law and a PhD on international and regional fisheries compliance. Additionally, she has spent 20 years in the area of fisheries, including over a decade as the head of FFA's legal services before assuming the Director General role. So, that I'd like to Thank Dr. Tapurusen and introduce her talk on improving sustainable tuna management and biodiversity conservation through earth observation data. Thank you. Thank you, Leah, and a warm good fellow morning to all of you from FFA. Uh, at the outset, we sincerely thank our host, Geo, Geo Blue Planet, for organizing this important workshop series. It's an honor for FFA to join you and our esteemed colleagues to discuss how we improve sustainable tuna management and biodiversity conservation through Earth observation data. And as discussed uh, with Leah, the key way FFA contributes contributes to sustainability through the use of earth observation data is on our work to combat illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. So that will be the focus of this presentation. Uh, we also recognize the central role that our tuna fishery sector plays in the economic security and food security of our Pacific people uh, and recognizing the impacts of COVID on key sectors such as tourism and trade compounded by the impacts of natural disasters on agriculture. Also the continued challenge that we face with climate change and its impacts on our tuna fisheries. So uh, these challenges emphasize even more the importance of our tuna fisheries sector continuing to function effectively and that they're protected and sustainably utilized. And this is central to our economic recovery and critical for the future of our people. And now more than ever, the importance of our cooperation during these challenging times. And this was underlined recently by our Pacific fisheries ministers. Okay, I'm just trying to get to the next slide. Um, it's not working for me, but I will try. Okay, there we go. We'll first provide a short background about FFA for those of you who have joined us that are not as familiar with our work. Now, uh, we fully appreciate that in combating IUU fishing, no one succeeds alone in any of our, our work in the tuna fishery sector. And this is a responsibility that we all share, noting that the tools we've set up and the lessons we've learned uh, in our tuna fishery spaces is one that we can discuss opportunities on um, at the end of the presentation. Okay, um, now what we're starting off here with is the vision of our fisheries ministers and of, and of our membership and uh, it honors the visionary decision by our leaders to set up FFA in the first place. 
and it is to ensure that our people enjoy the greatest possible social and economic benefits from sustainably utilizing our offshore fisheries resources. And so the work today continues to, to honor that, that vision. Also by way of background, what's front and center in FFA's work is the empowerment of our membership and through four high level goals, maximizing economic returns, but it's never just about the money, also ensuring that we enhance social returns. Uh, the key goal that we're speaking to here of combating IUU fishing in order to achieve the first two goals and nothing is possible as I mentioned already without not just maintaining regional solidarity, but also <clears throat> enhancing regional solidarity. And that's been key to the success of FFA for the past 41 years. And it's with that ultimate goal of ensuring that we can make a positive difference on the lives of the people we serve. Important to note for context as well that our membership are home to over 20% of the world's exclusive economic zones last year recorded our highest catch ever of nearly 3 million metric tons which contributes over 50 percent of the global tuna catch now you'll recognize that in the wcpo it is comprised of not just ffa members jurisdictions but also uh, non-ffa members and so if we carve out just our ffa membership and the catch from there that contributes to global catch it's about a third of the global catch and this is equivalent to about three billion us dollars in terms of government revenue and the returns uh, to our member countries uh, as government revenue. This is over 550 million US dollars and continues to trend upwards. And this is particularly in the space of the percent fishery. Employment in the tuna fishery sector is also trending upwards with over 22,000 and even this year, over 23,000 employed in the sector. And not forgetting, of course, uh, as part of the social benefits, ensuring that tuna fisheries can contribute to local food security needs. We've put up this visual just to capture in the best way that uh, in the Pacific, our membership have been successful in setting up the best managed fishery in the world and not just the largest, but also the best managed. So uh, this, this uh, diagram shows that really well in terms of uh, what's happening in our region, that the, the catch I mentioned earlier, nearly 3 million metric tons at, as, at, as of last year. And then looking across to other regions where it's not as fortunate in terms of the biological health of the stocks. Um, the green tower shows the stocks are healthy, but when we look across, it's not the same picture where some stocks are overfished or overfishing is occurring. But we're not complacent. Uh, we know we are challenged, for example, I mentioned already climate change, and then we look now at this topic on IU fishing as, as another key challenge we're facing. So with IUU fishing, we uh, commissioned a quantification study in 2016. And what it found is that uh, what the fish that's either caught illegally or transshipped illegally and landed uh, is, is equivalent to about uh, 600 million US dollars. And in terms of what is the lost economic rent to our members, uh, through access agreements, that's about 150 million US dollars. What the study also found is that over 95% of our IEU challenge, uh, not with the vessels that are unlicensed, but it is to do with vessels that are licensed who do not report their catch or misreport or underreport. So what has been our response to combating illegal fishing over the past uh, several decades? And what, what I've put on screen is to highlight that Earth observation data, um, and the key one that we use is VMS and AIS, uh, but just to highlight here that, that it feeds into an integrated framework for monitoring, control, and surveillance, and tools that have been set up by our members over several years. Thank you. 
so what I wanted to add there is you can see on screen the various tools that are in place. Uh, most of them are well established, but we're not complacent, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there are a few of these in development as regional tools, namely the electronic monitoring, electronic reporting, a persons of interest project, so that we're not just so focused on vessels compliance history and mapping that out in our regional surveillance picture, and also importantly, uh, emerging technologies. Now, focusing on the vessel tracking data that's received via satellite, as I mentioned, AIS and VMS, uh, the use of the vessel monitoring system provides us with the near real-time monitoring of known fishing vessels operating in the region, and those are registered on our FFA vessel register. Basically, you cannot be licensed by any of our 17 member countries unless you are on this register. And the vessel monitoring system is complemented with the use of the AIS data, uh, and that includes all different vessel types and also assists in locating fishing vessels, although its primary purpose is for sea safety, it's also used to help us uh, to track uh, vessels that uh, have stopped reporting on our vessel monitoring system for whatever reason. Now that positional data from VMS and AIS, they feed into all our other tools, the information um, and the analysis of vessel activity. And I've mentioned already our regional surveillance picture. And it's, if you look at the picture on the top um, green circle on the right, uh, the second one, regional surveillance picture, basically it's a common operating picture that identifies vessels uh, and the risks um, that we, we give a compliance rating to these vessels on the risk that they pose uh, to our to our region. And there's an analysis that goes behind the, the, the indexing risk uh, for each of the vessels. And they're basically color coded on this uh, regional surveillance picture. Uh, if you are color coded green, obviously no issues, but then it works from amber to red. For example, if uh, it flags up in the system that, that there's a question about your license, if you're in a in a, a certain member's area. FFA has also trialed and used satellite remote sensing technology for better analysis and situational awareness. Uh, we've used the satellite Apache radar and the images for that for targeted surveillance activity during planned surveillance operations. And uh, we can pick that up further in the discussion. Collaboration, and we say this all the time, uh, and, and I've said it at the beginning, can't, can't do this alone and the collaboration with partners is just so important. I've put up two examples of, of where we collaborate. One is with KIOST, uh, uh, the Korea Institute. It's an ongoing relationship since 2016, focused primarily on satellite aperture radar imagery and more recently on multiple remote sensing technologies. And we found this collaboration really useful in enhancing our understanding of SARS utilization, the satellite Apache radar utilization, and the related processes like how to acquire it, what to acquire, pre-processing, detection, and visualization, and understanding what right SAR image to enhance our detection rate. And that's also opened up new opportunities. And, and again, like I mentioned with SAR, we'll pick that up in, in the discussion. With DVD um, with Canada, uh, this has also been really useful in helping us to detect, detect dark vessels, basically vessels not reporting on VMS or AIS. And in our recent operation this year, uh, we were able to get that, this type of uh, assistance from Canada in, in initial trial. And this was already proving to be useful in enabling us to correlate uh, detections with our own VMS and AIS. So we look forward to continuing this type of collaboration. In terms of the lessons learned through use of satellite uh, data, we recognize at FFA that VMS and AIS continue to be our primary monitoring tools. Uh, we also recognize the use of SAR imagery data that, that will continue to enhance our, our information gathering and analysis on 
on the data that we hold, um, increase the confidence in the VMS and AIS data, as I've mentioned. And we are also continuing to develop our capacity to effectively handle and analyze processed remote sensing data. Can't have a presentation these days without really understanding the COVID impacts on our key MCS tools. And basically this was with the Observer program. So um, suffice to say that whilst the Observer program, our aerial surveillance program were uh, impacted, uh, what's really come to the fore is the, that this is an integrated MCS framework and we're able to draw on our other tools that I've mentioned, such as the VMS and AIS so that we can continue to to support our members in combating illegal fishing um, and I've put put on screen uh, some of those key responses the use of our regional surveillance picture informed by the VMS and AIS which has helped us with contact tracing of vessels including through uh, transshipments and bunkering and uh, also to identify vessels that have come from COVID-19 affected countries and, uh, and we've reinstated um, our regional operations which had been temporarily impacted by COVID when it first broke in March. And so um, again, uh, those tools, VMS and AIS, SAR, DVD, continuing to be informed, um, continuing to inform uh, how best we utilize our limited enforcement capacity. So looking at the opportunities, uh, continuing to strengthen our analyt and analytical capacity, as I mentioned earlier, uh, developing relationships so that we get a really full understanding of future satellite technology options, how they can be incorporated into that analysis process. Also promoting dialogue and sharing information just as we're doing on this platform so that we can better understand and harness satellite technology and never forgetting cooperation at all levels, um, such as through these uh, types of platforms and, and through these partnerships. And then the last slide is just to remember um, always uh, why we do what we do and why we must give it our best and it's for our people. Thank you very much, Leah. And, and I sincerely apologize to all of you and I'd love to have an opportunity to, to chat further next time. Um, going to have to dash now from my next commitment, but I leave you in the very competent hands of our Director of Fisheries Operations, Ellen Rahari. Thank you. I thank you so much for joining us today. I think we have a lot to learn from the Pacific and I really look forward to further discussion about FFA's integrated framework for monitoring. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat. Um, we do have about 25 minutes at the end to have a discussion. So if you want to save your questions till then, please feel free. Um, so next, I want to welcome Amanda Nixon from the Pew Charitable Trust. Thank you very much, Leah. I'm just doing my best to get the screen share happening, which I hope sure. that we have now managed. Yeah, so real quick, I just want to give a brief uh, introduction to our next speaker. Um, Amanda Nixon directs Pew's international fisheries efforts to conserve important marine species through science-based policy development and advocacy. Her work includes reducing overfishing, minimizing the impact of destructive fishing gear, and eliminating illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Before Pew, she also developed and led the World Wildlife Fund's Bycatch Initiative which is a major policy and field program aimed at in reducing incidental catch of non-target species and fisheries for more than 20 countries in the world. And so today I'd like to thank Amanda for her presentation on improving sustainable tuna management and biodiversity conservation through EO data. Thank you very much, Leah. As you can see, like the last, like my uh, learned colleague, um, Manu, in the last presentation, we've chosen a very similar title. We've taken this one. Uh, right from the intent of the session. Um, so thank you all for joining for this. Um, and thank you very much to uh, Geo Blue Planet for the opportunity to present, both a, a privilege and a pleasure. To begin with, um, let me note that Pew Charitable Trusts is a non-government organization focused largely on improving public policy through problem solving based on evidence. 
Uh, we are nonpartisan and look towards uh, analysis of the best available evidence to contribute to problem solving. We have product, uh, we have projects and programs over 40 in total, uh, stretching across the United States and internationally, and stretching across uh, the realm of environment, um, both marine and terrestrial, through to issues of government performance um, and associated domestic policies within the U.S. In our international fisheries program, we have um, a number of lines of work focused around three key areas. One is on ending illegal fishing. One is looking at um, improving RFMO management. And one line of work looks specifically at ending overfishing in Northwestern Europe. Ultimately, our primary interest in this program is to assist and support the building out of international fisheries governance to ensure that there is a comprehensive set of science-based management tools, along with a comprehensive um, uh, network of oversight and enforcement, which I often um, summarize as ensuring that within the international fisheries realm, we have rules about how much we can take out and how, and then also consequences if the rules are not followed uh, to ensure that we achieve sustainability. Moving to the second slide. Oops, there we are. Okay. Um, first up, I want to just show you this map that you may have seen before, um, which is the management of global tuna fisheries internationally. And this occurs via five tuna regional fisheries management organizations. Um, these collectively cover about 90% of the oceans uh, surface and they have a mandate to manage tuna fishing and its associated impacts across their various overlapping convention areas. The reason this matters is you can see that um, ensuring that there is sustainable management of tuna fisheries has a, an enormous and widespread impact and it involves a very large number of countries um, and industry and NGO uh, stakeholders in securing effectively um, sustainable management of one of the largest uh, renewable protein sources on the planet. When we look at that, um, as uh, was pointed out previously, it's impossible to not also take into account the impact of COVID-19 on the oversight of fisheries over this um, strange year, not the least of which has been the removal, as was also previously noted, or the rolling back of uh, human observers on many fishing vessels as a way to collect and verify data. So this points immediately to um, the incredible importance of um, Earth observation data and associated technologies. This is also a huge opportunity given that there are there is still sufficient insufficient RFMO management and oversight of the of their stocks, even though we are seeing improvements over time. Um, the opportunities prevented by presented by Earth observation data um, could help accelerate uh, sustainable management um, over the next couple of years. This is an alternative look at uh, the RFMO uh, mandates. So you can see sort of the level of overlap there are there. There is there. Okay. So let's talk a bit about uh, sustainability of tuna fisheries. Um, first off, you know, you need to know where these uh, tunas are and you need to know the status of the stocks. Um, and if we know how endangered a stalker species is, that obviously helps to inform what management procedures and catch limits should be set by the regional fisheries management organization member countries when they come together to improve sustainability and protect the species. So if you look at this slide, you can see that on the left, there are three different uh, species of bluefin tuna. And on the right, you can see their different habitats. And so, uh, this is important in understanding their distributions and how to manage fishing of these stocks. So how does Earth observation data help improve sustainable management? Well, there are a number of really concrete ways in which that happens. One is you can map the fishing grounds for particular specific species. 
which allows you to target species of interest rather than indiscriminate catch. And it allows you to look at um, issues around uh, bycatch management and how to reduce it if you know where there are bycatch interactions based on um, overlapping uh, earth observation data, you can actually use that to help you manage. You can also identify fishing grounds for protected or endangered species in such a way that you can provide enforcement officials with possible locations of illegal fishing. Um, and you can use uh, various tools to enable you to do that. So these are just two really quite specific areas that you can look at. It would appear that this slide managed to uh, duplicate those points there, so sorry about that, but that we'll just put that as the emphasis on how important they are. Now, moving on to types of Earth observation data, there are all kinds that you can use, and here you can see uh, in this particular slide um, some of the various different types. You can see sea surface temperatures, like in the image above or right here in front of you, can help uh, fisheries managers and fishers get a better sense of where fish are likely to be based on their habitat preferences. You can also use other data sets, such as sea surface currents, subsea surface temperatures, plankton concentrations, altimetry, which is, involves sea surface height anomalies, thermocline depths, um, salinity, the list goes on. So the ability to take all of this data um, and analyze it can provide a much clearer and more detailed picture of where fish are likely to be, where you might wish to um, concentrate oversight and enforcement actions, how you might wish to uh, determine um, data for stock assessments and use that, and how you might wish to um, construct uh, distribution of fishing effort across range. Other kinds of tools and uses um, include things like, and I'm going to give you a specific example here. Um, we recently launched, together with Global Fishing Watch, the Carrier Vessel Portal, which uses AIS data to monitor carrier vessel activity in the five global tuna RFMOs, um, and can be used alongside Earth observation data to help improve fisheries management. So you take the AIS data to help inform fisheries managers of the impact of the fishing industry on global stocks and help inform scientists and policymakers of which stocks need stronger catch limits. So for example, the the vessel portal shows fisheries stakeholders where fish are being captured by fishing vessels, where they're being transferred to large cargo vessels, and then what ports they land in. So this can actually help us understand the distribution of fishing effort and help managers see how far catch travels from the point of capture to the point of landing. In addition, you can use it to, uh, you can compare uh, reported activity against earth observation data to determine whether there is a mismatch between what is being reported and what is actually happening, or where there is a level of uncertainty around what is being reported versus what is actually happening. And that's very helpful when you're looking at uh, um, gathering an analysis of intelligence to help reduce illegal and regulated um, or unreported fishing, or to reduce um, unreported instances of um, transshipment, which can offer opportunities for other convergence crimes as well. So here's another specific example here. So as we said, um, using Earth observation data along with uh, vessel activity data can help improve our understanding of fishing patterns and activities. So uh, in, a, in addition, it can help all aspects of the fishing industry improve management efforts Fleet managers and fishing companies can improve their operations by targeting specific species of interest rather than indiscriminate targeting. And decision makers can understand their stocks better and create more sustainable and equitable policies. So in a study that we recently re um, released with uh, Global Fishing Watch and Pew, we looked at comparing fishing effort in the Southern India Ocean against sea surface temperatures to map where fishing activity was observed in relation to key southern bluefin tuna habitats. And the idea here was that this could help determine if fishing activity could have involved capture of southern bluefin tuna in addition to the capture of other tuna species. And the reason this matters is because if you refer back to 
uh, the initial map of the tuna RFMOs, southern bluefin tuna is managed by a different RFMO than those other species. And so you'd want to make sure that you had the ability to determine that catches were managed and legal, and this data and analysis helps you do that. The analysis was, prevented, was presented to the RFMO, which manages southern bluefin tuna, to help inform policies on improving monitoring, control, and surveillance effort. So the use of earth observation data can occur both in um, almost real-time monitoring, as was presented by um, our colleague from FFA uh, in the previous presentation. It can also be taken and analyzed and used to actually provide intelligence to managers over a period of time that allows them to improve their oversight and management in an RFMO context. That essentially covers the kind of main points that I wanted to bring to you today. It's difficult to know coming into a forum like this how to present things that will not be duplicative with other presenters. But I think the key points that we would be looking to make um, from a Pew perspective here is that the, the rapid growth in provision and access to earth observation data, and I'll go back to this for a moment, as, as tools like this demonstrate, in the last number of years has massively improved the ability of um, countries and specific managers in countries to gain a better shared understanding of how stocks are moving, how fishing behavior is occurring, and to also be able to determine where greater levels of oversight and enforcement are needed or where management policies need to change. And this can occur, as I said, in a, a sort of real-time oversight context, or it can be fed into um, RFMO science and um, compliance processes to enable these multilateral organizations to better manage their tuna fisheries. And when you consider the 90% of the ocean that these RFMOs are responsible for um, overseeing tuna fishing across, the use of this kind of data becomes an invaluable tool in moving towards a more modern, um, future-proofed oversight of fishing activity. We don't want to be, find ourselves in future in a situation again where limitations such as COVID has placed on um, oversight this year prevents us from delivering sustainability. And we're right at the cusp at this point of being able to make use of these new emerging excellent tools to really create a new benchmark and improve management and oversight of tuna fisheries globally. Um, thanks very much. I understand questions may come later, so I hand back to Leah at this point. Great, thank you, Amanda, for that presentation. Um, I will say that our last session covered um, or had presenters from RFMOs and they shared the challenges of management in their certain areas. And so by you sharing these tools, I think it's a great um, way to integrate both earth observation data and other types of information to have something tangible for these managers. So thanks for that. Um, next, I would like much. to welcome um, Dr. Robert Ahrens. And so I will make you a presenter if you're able to share your screen. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get you to do it, Leah. There's yeah, no some worries. weird administrative thing going on that's not working. Sure, no problem. I apologize. I'll bring it up right now. All right, and as that is coming up, I'd like to welcome Dr. Robert Ahrens, who is a fisheries research biologist and heads the Management Strategy and Evaluation Group in the Fisheries Resource and Monitoring Division of the NOAA Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center. He is currently leading a team using remote sense data and machine learning to define and predict areas of interaction between protected species and the Hawaii Long Line. Before his work at NOAA, he was a former associate professor in the University of Florida Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences Program. Um, and I'd like to welcome Robert and his talk on Turtle Watch, Reducing Protected Species Interactions. Great, thank you. Thank you, Leah. Um, you know, I think we've we've heard how important tuna fisheries are um, just to well-being and and really we need to work quite carefully with 
those involved in the fisheries um, when we have protected species interactions. In the US, we know that hitting certain limits on protected species interactions can cause, has, has some severe ramification for fisheries. And in the case of the YN shallow set longline fishery and its interaction with turtles, this can shut the fishery down. And so integrating earth observations um, with what we know about species biology provides an opportunity to provide information to the fishers to avoid these interactions. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the Turtle Watch, which came out in, in 2006 um, and really was the, the brainchild of, of Evan Howell and others at the Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center, um, came out as an information product to fishers. The fishery had undergone a significant change in retooling um, and change in setting practices to substantially reduce species interactions, but there was still a recognition that interactions were occurring and this uh, one of the first dynamic ocean products uh, to come out um, really tried to identify a critical area of where those interactions were occurring through the use of satellite data and so using information from about 105 loggerhead turtles um, they were able to identify the north pacific transition zone as a key area of concentration of turtles and foraging in particular, it identified the chlorophyll front. And in the winter, so the first quarter of the calendar year for us, um, is when most of the interactions were occurring. And so they, they wanted a tool that helped uh, identify that 18 degrees Celsius um, band for the fishermen and disseminate that information at a daily uh, level to them. So if we move over to the, the plots on the right-hand side of the screen, we can see uh, three graphs here, one identifying the sea surface temperature across the x-axis and the loggerhead turtle interactions that occurred at those sea surface temperatures, the locations of the sets themselves and the temperatures, and then the locations of the individual turtle locations based on the Argo satellite um, information. And the inner quartile of the distribution of the loggerhead turtle interactions really was spanned by that 17.5 to 18.5 degrees Celsius band. And therefore, the, the notion was if, in, if we provide this information to fishers and they wish to reduce their interactions, they can avoid this one degree C band and that should have a noticeable impact on the number of interactions that were occurring. And so if we look right down at the bottom on the right, this is the product that gets released in an email. It identifies the band in this maroon or burgundy color, burgundy probably, um, and and that is provided daily to to fishermen, and they can they can use that information to avoid turtles if they wish. So I got involved in this product in in attempting. You know, it's 2020 now. So has this product work? What is the what is the efficacy of this product? Can you go to the next slide, please. And so we have a lot more information now to evaluate this. So the plot in front of you shows the locations of about 380 tagged loggerhead turtles. The histogram up on the right is the days at which those turtles were at large. And we can see generally they've been out for about a year. Um, the numbers across the middle indicate where those turtles were just, uh, released from. So this is work that has been with um, Japanese uh, scientists who have done a lot of the, the release work from captive breeding programs. Um, some of the releases were captive breeders uh, that were taken out to sea and released in the middle of the Pacific. And then in, over in the Eastern Pacific, we have interactions that occurred and, and, and turtles that were released on long line vessels. These polygons represent the minimum convex hulls of the qual quarterly um, distribution of the Hawaii shallow set long line vessels. And what's really important to take away, we'll notice in quarter one here in the dark blue, is where a number of the most of the interactions since 2005 had occurred. And then the next is in quarter four, moving into the winter where we have the next highest interactions. And if we look at the interaction rate per unit of, of effort, which deals with uh, space and, and soak time, 
we can see that the interaction rates um, are highest in those quarters. And so if we take move on to the next slide, we can take a closer look at why those interactions are occurring. So on the left here, we have the distribution of the shallow set long line sets in the blue with the lightest color representing the 95% uh, quartile or quantiles and the um, darker blue, the inner quartile. And we can see that if we begin at the, the beginning of the year in quarter one, there's a strong overlap between the turtles. The fishery itself moves to the south while the turtles tend to move north creating a separation in those activities, and they rejoin again, moving back into the fourth quarter of the year. Moving over to the uh, right-hand side, we have in the red hatched area is this turtle watch band. And we can see, if we look at the distribution of those shallow sets by quarter, the inner quartiles of those sets since 2005 are still overlapping with the turtle watch band. There has actually been a slight shift to slightly cooler waters in recent times. So we can still identify quarter one and quarter four as areas of high overlap between this key ecological area and the fishery itself. Move to the next slide, please. So let's take a, a little closer look. If we look at the quarterly distribution of the tag turtles relative to the turtle watch band, um, we see that the tag turtles have a smaller uh, species distribution than the, again, uh, burgundy color over in the bottom right, relative to what we see in the fishery, which are is in the purple color. So we're seeing individuals between 40 and 80 um, standard characters length in the fishery, whereas a lot of the turtles were smaller. But what we observe is that smaller turtles are using cooler waters in the first quarter of the year. And then we progress to warmer waters for the larger turtles. And this is a pattern that repeats across quarters. So we know in the first quarter, if we look at the overlap with the turtle watch band, we expect to be interacting with the turtles that we do interact with. And as we move into the fourth quarter of the year, we expect to interact with smaller turtles. But this sets up an interesting challenge because it says if you were to move north of the turtle watch bands, you'd intercept likely more numerous small turtles. And if you move south, you are likely to interact with larger turtles. The larger turtles, of course, having a greater nester equivalent value. Next slide, please. And now if we look at it all together, again, we have the turtle watch band in the hatched red. We can look at the distribution of all the tags per quarter. That's the, the tags one. We can look at the distribution of tags that occur in the overlap with the fishery. That's the minimum convex hull of the fishery in that. We can look at the overlap of the sets that are occurring and then the overlap of the intercepts. And really the take home from this is that in theory, the turtle watch band, if fishers were choosing to avoid it should significantly still reduce the interactions that we're seeing it is as as an information product going out to fishermen it is still a valuable tool to avoid turtles but can we go to the next slide please but we're also interested in not having severe impacts on the fishery and so the plots here are the logarithm of the the catch rate in this case swordfish of this fishery and the sea surface band. The black is the actual individual sets that have occurred in the fishery with darker colors indicating more sets. The red is the turtle watch band and the yellow dots are the interactions with turtles with yellow being one turtle and up to red being three turtles. And again, in quarter one, we see that strong overlap with the turtle watch band, but north of that band into cooler waters, we have also a significant number of interactions. If we move into quarters two and quarters three, those interactions that are occurring are disassociated with that chlorophyll front and appear to be more random encounters. And then as we move back into quarter four, there's again a strong interaction associated with uh, that band representing the chlorophyll front. Next slide, please. And so if we look at 
that catch rate a little more specifically, this is the quarter one catch rate of swordfish standardized for, for area and, and hooks. Across the temperature bands, we see a fairly level catch rate. And this has some interesting implications because it says that the fish, the fishers are behaving so that no area is standing out. And if that is the case, then if we asked fishers to remove effort from one area, the turtle watch band, which is occurring here between the 18.5 or the 17.5 and 18.5 band, that effort is going to be displaced out. And it is likely to reduce the catch rate in those other areas. So the avoidance of turtles will cost the fishery in catch rate. Can we go to the next slide, please? So how has the fishers behaved as they've reached the allowable cap that we have on loggerheads? So on the y-axis, there every year there is a cap um, of the allowable catch of loggerheads that have been placed. And then we can see as they move up that y-axis, they're approaching that cap. The color of the dots represents the distance away from the turtle watch band that the fishery is operating. And the size of the circles represents the number of interactions contributing as they approach to that catch. And if you generally scan across this plot, we see that as they approach the cap, there does not tend to be a great deal of movement away from that turtle watch band. The only time that we see a big one is in 2018. And this is actually where those interactions were occurring in the second quarter of the year when the fishery had itself moved away from the band. So this suggests that the fishers themselves tend not to respond or use the turtle watch band to avoid turtles. Next slide, please. So can we provide a, a bigger, a better product than simply a, a daily update of some, some observed ocean in temperatures? Um, so can we, in, in the dynamic ocean uh, management sense, can we zone in on really critical areas where interactions occur that we can provide to the fishermen instead of just this general band out there? And, with, and will that improve things? Um, so in this part of this, we, we took a great deal of ocean observations, put it in an ensemble random forest model, and are then able, if you look up on the top left of the plot, able to predict um, areas of interactions that are expected for the turtles and the associated oceanographic, or physical and dynamic variables that are associated with those interactions. And we know there's a, a product out EcoCast right now, which is doing this up for the California or the West Coast. Um, and again, can we provide this more detailed interaction information to fishermen? Next slide, please. And we can break that information down for fishermen if we wanted into quarterly products where we would have here in the in the green is the areas of higher highest probability of overlap. And we can provide that each quarter. We can provide that weekly. Um, next slide, please. And we can provide it for multiple species. So we can run these sorts of models for everything. So here we have it in the top left for loggerhead, in the middle top, leatherbacks, oceanic white tip, in the bottom left, giant manta ray, in the, the bottom. And then over on the right, we have false killer whale. But this raises a challenge for us because as we start to look at these areas of high overlaps for all these species, and we want to recommend the fishery avoids them, we're stuck with the question of where does that fishery go? So imagine saying, well, north of this area, uh, you can avoid loggerhead and leatherback turtles, but that would force likely the fishery south into the area of overlap with oceanic white tip and giant manta ray. And so clearly there's going to be trade-offs that we're gonna to have to address when we start to move into a multi-species product. We also have big issues such as false killer whales that tend not to have a well-defined area or habitat that they're using that's poorly defined by the oceanography. And how do we deal with those interactions? Next slide, please. 
So what can we say about using Earth observations um, to help tuna fisheries be viable out there while still providing um, conservation benefits? We know that we can model these interactions and how they relate to the dynamic oceanography out there. And we can do this even with rare events, which has been quite challenging. Um, the utility we know of these models really is going to depend upon how well defined that species envelope is. Um, these are phenomenological models, and unless there's strong signals in the data, um, they, they, they don't have a lot of utility at defining key areas. We really need to consider how this will affect target species catch rate. Effort will redistribute in response to any management recommendation, and how will this impact the catch rates of the fishery and the viability of the fishery? We might have synergistic options to reduce interactions with multiple species. Protecting loggerheads in certain areas may help protect leatherback turtles, but it may not. It may move the fishery into other areas that we did not intend. It may move them up into areas for black-footed albatross or something like that. And finally, how do we want to manage? What information do we want to provide? So these are dynamic observations. We need to carefully consider the nature of the input data into the models that we're going to use to provide these sorts of recommendations. On what time scale do we want to provide that information? And are those products available? And I'll end it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that presentation. I think you've given us a lot to think about the challenges of incorporating both dynamic models or dynamic variables and trying to prioritize different species um, protections at the same time, as well as um, account for fisher behavior. Um, so I'm sure we will get into that and into the discussion. Thank you. Um, so next I'd like to welcome our final speaker, um, Dr. Patrick Lahodi. So Patrick, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Um, so Patrick is a senior fishery scientist for the Oceanic Fisheries Program at the Secret Secretariat of the Pacific Community and is on a sabbatical year from Collecte Localisation Satellite, CLS in France. Um, his time in France is spent on developing a modeling team on marine ecosystem and fisheries, and he has returned to SPC to continue the development of the CPUDEM model, which integrates information on prey and large oceanic predators. Um, so I'd like to introduce Patrick's talk, Integrating Earth Observation in Ocean Ecosystem Modeling for Improving Sustainable Tuna Management, Biodiversity, and Conservation. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. So you can hear me clearly? Yes, I could hear you and I could see your presentation. OK, good. So good morning or afternoon. And thank you, Leah and GeoBlue Planet, for the invitation to give uh, the presentation to this workshop. So you give the title, you gave the title of my presentation. So it's quite similar to the title of the general session, but with one more step forward to include Earth observation in ecosystem and tuna modeling. Of course, this is a very long-term uh, goal, which started uh, in 1995, indeed, and si since received contribution from many colleagues. So I cannot list all of them here, but uh, they all can be found in the publication references uh, included in this presentation. So the effort to observe Earth and especially ocean has been massive since the last two decades. That include uh, multiple sensors on board satellites and in situ data from moorings, profilers, gliders, uh, vessels of opportunity, and now sailing drones or even animals equipped with sensors. So of course, this is a really great achievement for oceanographers and marine biologists, but in the same time, it becomes difficult to navigate in this big ocean of data if you are not an expert. Fortunately, uh, if the amount of data is growing exponentially, they are now ingested 
through dedicated programs to feed operational models of physical and biochemical uh, oceans, allowing to quickly progress toward more and more accurate and realistic simulation of the key essential variables that we need, marine biologists and fisheries scientists. These variables are uh, temperature, salinity, currents for the physique, uh, primary pollution, dissolved oxygen, and also on our pH with the issue of ocean acidification and climate change for the biochemistry. It's still recent for the biochemistry, but all these models assimilate data either in real time or uh, in the production of um, reanalysis of historical data sets. However, I think to understand the ecology and population dynamics of large marine species like tuna or protected species, and thus to develop models and management tools, as we discussed already, uh, two essential variables are still missing. They are the pre-distribution of these species, either uh, zooplankton uh, for the, the larvae of fish, or micronectin for larger animals and adult, uh, adult fish. This slide, this slide illustrates the importance of primary and secondary production, so uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton, on tuna larvae uh, survival uh, condition and subsequent recruitment. Uh, during the powerful 1997-98 El Nino, uh, a very unusual large intense bloom of phytoplankton was observed at the peak of this event. This is what we observe on this uh, satellite image of ocean color, chlorophyll. And it was followed a few months later by a very large increase of juvenile tuna, mainly skipjack and yellowfin, in the person uh, fishery in the equatorial uh, region. As observed from catch and size frequencies of catch, we see the, the very uh, unusual peaks in, in the, the juvenile uh, uh, tuna. The delay uh, match quite well the, the growth of this species, and so we can assume that the peak in recruitment was likely associated to very favorable conditions for the survival of tuna larvae with warm waters and high concentration of food, that is uh, zooplankton, developing uh, quickly after the phytoplankton. Now for uh, larger animals, when tuna grows, um, we know that these uh, animals are spending a lot of time to uh, search for food. And indeed with reproduction, searching for food are probably the two key activities driving the behavior and thus the distribution and ecology of these species. And each species has evolved and occupied different ecological niches. Many of them can access large biomass of mesopelagic species in the subsurface. Uh, you have two examples here with an elephant seal and a big eye tuna, both tracked during several days with electronic devices and showing how they manage to uh, dive to get uh, this meso mesopelagic uh, fish species below uh, 200 uh, meters. Unfortunately, we still miss uh, a lot of information and observation on this mesopelagic uh, species, and despite they represent the largest biomass on Earth. I've been working uh, for long with my colleagues on the mod modeling of this foraging species. And today we can propose a model representing one group of zooplankton and six groups of epipelagic and mesopelagic micronectin, defined according to their vertical migration behavior and some macroecological relationship linking time of development to water temperature. So we simplify the vertical structure of the ocean into three layers, so the epipelagic, and upper and lower mesopelagic layers, so between surface and 800-1000 meters. Uh, primary pollution as the source of energy and ocean temperature 
drive the temporal dynamics of these groups, while oceanic currents control the spatial dynamics. We have uh, recently uh, released a first kind of reanalysis of, of this uh, model, uh, simulation for this group uh, through the European uh, Copernicus uh, Marine Program. The simulation, so it's publicly available through this uh, website. The simulation covers the satellite era, so starting from uh, 1998 after the launch, launching of SeaWiths. Uh, it's a simulation at the resolution of quarter degree per week and using oceanic fields, so temperature and currents provided by the Mercator Ocean Global Ocean Circulation Model and primary pollution uh, derived from uh, uh, satellite uh, ocean color data. Early next year, we will release an upgrade of this product at higher resolution, 112 degree and per day. These zooplankton and microconnecton uh, outputs have been already used by some colleagues with uh, animal tracking data, and their studies suggest there is a, a, an interest to use them rather than the ocean color to study their habitat and feeding ecology. This biophysical environment has also been used extensively to simulate the spatial dynamics of tuna with the model Cipodim that indeed was designed originally uh, for that purpose, purpose. The modeling relies on the definition of key habitats. First, the spawning habitat that combines three uh, mechanisms of high or low favorability. So one is for the density, the access to the, the, the prey, so the density of prey of, of larvae. In that case, we use zooplankton. Another is to find the optimal range of temperature uh, of the species for spawning and, and uh, uh, favorable uh, larval growth. And the third one is to consider the density of predators of larvae, and that's my connection. Then the feeding habitat. Here we define an accessibility coefficient for each vertical layer, depending on preference or tolerance to key variables for the species. And in the case of tuna, we know that temperature and oxygen are uh, critical parameters to account for. So this accessibility coefficient is then used as a weighting factor of microconnectin biomass present in each layer during daytime or nighttime. And finally, the habitat index is simply the sum of these products and uh, scaled between zero and one. So uh, I show two examples of uh, uh, to illustrate this habitat, this habitat definition. So the larvae distribution of uh, bluefin in the Gulf of Mexico that we uh, try to define uh, according to some observation we have. And uh, on this animation that you should uh, see, uh, it's not tuna, it's loggerhead turtle. Uh, a work that we we done with uh, Melanie, uh, Jeff Polo, Melanie Abikasi, Jeff Polovina in Hawaii. So it's useful to use this data set because we have exact position of the, the movement of the species, which is not the case for, for, for tuna, unfortunately. And so you see uh, on the top, uh, you have the uh, habitat background, um, sorry, the, the habitat with the background color. So with the red is a, a very high uh, favorable habitat. And uh, so we were able to follow this uh, habitat and tracks of species of uh, animals uh, over more than one year. And in the second animation in the bottom, it's uh, um, a simulation showing the, the movement of predicted density of animals that we uh, test uh, with uh, some simple uh, rules of displacement based on the gradient of the habitat in a framework, Eulerian framework with advection diffusion equations. And so you can see that the, both the habitat and the, the movement, predicted movement, 
uh, match quite well with observed tracks over more than one year. So here, a snapshot after four months and more than 11 months. So altogether, we can we can assemble uh, these different pieces of the puzzle, so the habitat, the movement, and add uh, a structured population to define a, a raw spatial fish population model. So we also need to add the growth and the mortality and mechanisms to recruit the larvae in, in, the, uh, in the first cohort. Uh, so this model has been developed for, for different species tuna, species of tuna, and of course they are exploited species. So we, we define also the, the, the different fishing fleets and use the catch and also uh, the size frequency of catch and tagging data when they are available to estimate the parameters of the model, like in a classical uh, standard uh, stock assessment model. And so the, the model provides uh, typically uh, management indicators, so the, the impact of fishing, but also it can uh, uh, it, it gives some information on the impact of uh, environmental variability. So you have a, a list of papers here where you can uh, find much more detail on, on this approach and different applications. I show here just a, a one illustration of this model for the skipjack in the Pacific. So the background color is the density of uh, predicted density of skipjacks so the, in uh, metric ton per square kilometers. Uh, red is high. Uh, and the um, uh, black circles are observed uh, catch. So it's proportional to the observed catch by the person fishery in the, in the Pacific. And I show you here just two uh, different uh, snapshots. One here in uh, January 2013. So it, we are in a neutral or starting La Nina uh, event with all the, 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 the core uh, fishing ground and, and, and the core uh, habitat of the species in the western uh, equatorial region. And after, uh, during the development of uh, El Nino, so the last one we got, we get, we got in 2015-2016, uh, we can see that uh, the model predicts uh, the extension of the, the habitat and also the movement of the it showed the, the movement of, of, of the fishing fleet to follow the, the, the fish to the central Pacific. We also uh, were able to develop a regional application for the, it was a, a project for the Indonesian government, the project INDESO. In that case, we defined a high resolution regional model at 112 degree per day. Uh, in real time and uh, of course in that case you need also the global model to provide the, the condition at the open boundaries of the regional model because fish can enter and exit uh, this uh, small small domain so once it has been optimized with historical data sets of fishing and validated outside of the optimization windows or against other data and models like standard stock assessment outputs. The model provides a useful tool to either test management scenarios or develop real-time application to assist in the monitoring of fisheries and especially uh, maybe to, to help in the detection of uh, IUU or to monitor impact of pollution on the uh, fisheries and, 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 and fish distribution. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that Integrated systems for ocean modeling makes the forecast of fish stocks a true possibility. The two essential ecosystem variables, so plankton and myconecton, uh, that we need are becoming available in addition to physical and biochemical variables. Models as a habitat or spatial dynamics will provide uh, new management tools with additional features for spatial management. These models can help to uh, discriminate between fishing and environmental impact, including also the projection of climate change. 
there are tools, as I said, to support the, the monitoring of fisheries in, in real time. And they provide the rapid feedback on the quality and the gaps to address in priority. And I will finish here. I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I think it's a really great example of how we could combine both Earth observations and modeling, especially such a layered model that incorporates um, environmental factors, habitat switching, and population dynamics. Um, so thanks for that. Um, we have about 20 minutes for discussion with our panelists today, um, and I would like to open the floor to participants to either unmute their camera or unmute their mics to ask a question, or you could add it in the chat and I could read it for you. Oh, and I already have a question. Okay, so we do have one question from Hassan. Um, and he says, we heard from several panelists that EO data and tools are now uh, maybe the only data that is available to monitor tuna fisheries during the pandemic. Um, first, is EO data easily discoverable and accessible? Um, in other words, are your teams able to find and access EO data? If not, what do you think will need to be done to meet the needs of EO data? And two, is EO data or EO data products and tools, oh, excuse me, is the data or data products and tools that are useful for tuna management? Um, so I could go in order of our speakers today. Um, so I'll start with our representative from FFA. If Alan is, Alan Rahari is on the line. Thank you, Leah, and uh, good morning from uh, from Honduras Solomon Islands. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Dr. Manu, who's uh, had another appointment and had to leave uh, this this meeting. Um, but in terms of the use of uh, EO data um, um, during this pandemic, um, the EO data, um, of course, is one of the uh, the primary tools that we use in terms of uh, monitoring, uh, control, and surveillance. Uh, um, um, of you know uh, the Western Central Pacific Ocean, um, so the, so uh, as um, as you would have uh, heard, um, um, observer coverage uh, uh, on uh, passenger vessels uh, have been temporarily suspended, uh, and due to the suspension of this particular tool, uh, we are now relying on um, uh, EO data, particularly the vessel monitoring system and AIS data, uh, so, uh, and also um, other conventional uh, data to support our monitoring. So definitely um, this information is uh, accessible uh, through, uh, of course, uh, providers, particularly with AIS, uh, but also through our own vessel monitoring system um, that we administer for our members. Um, so that's basically what I can say with regard to, uh, to the question. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Amanda, can you review the availability of the tools that you shared with Global Fishing Watch? Sure, so I was actually going to say, I think there's a number of different um, ways that you can access Earth observation data. Recently, there's been the development of the Global Fishing Watch website where you can actually see all kinds of analysis and you can also partner with GFW, I believe, to um, pay for additional analysis. Um, but there is a lot of data there that you can um, mine for your own purposes. There's also services like Ocean Mind, which is um, an even more sophisticated outfit in terms of being able to acquire and analyze um, data that would uh, and help you with those analytics in terms of how to use them. Um, I think as well, there is the ability to um, purchase particular Earth observation data from different providers. Obviously, that's quite expensive. But I think in the first instance at the moment, there's a couple of things that the presentations have shown up. And one of them is that there are a number of different um, projects underway with specific governments um, where things are made available. There's a number of different um, website portals where that information is starting to become available. So I think it, and I think we're going to see that level of availability and richness of analysis continue to expand fairly rapidly over the, the next couple of years. So uh, I hope that sort of starts you off in starting starting to think about how to access and use these kinds of data. 
Thank you, Amanda, for that. I uh, thank you for sharing the GFW um, uh, site. Uh, I just want to just say a few words about the GFW. During th this time, at least, uh, um, it's very hard really to access their data. Um, it, it, they are just sharing it with only specific people. Uh, that uh, It's unfortunate to see that, but that's, that's the reality of the world today is that data are not accessible to everyone. So, so something that to bear in mind and think about what is really needed today is it really data or data product? That's that's my, my question, second question that I put there. It, it's not always easy for any scientist, even with the tuna fisheries, to pro, to really work with the EO data, uh, EO data. but maybe, uh, I mean, the most what they use is a product of that data. I think CLS have shown some of that capabilities. So anyway, I will stop here. No, I think you make a really good point, and I'll, I'll just make a couple of responses to that. There's very little data with respect to fisheries management that's available in full in real time, in no small part due to the fact that there is a lot of concern about who needs to see the data, to what degree it's commercial or proprietary, and in some cases, the lack of formal arrangements for data sharing. So in a lot of cases, when the analyses that we present to you get done, they actually are done in using kind of data from some time ago that can now be accessed in aggregate and analyzed. And as you'll see in the chat, I think Dr. Arenz is, is certainly indicating that BMS data is only accessible by um, agencies who have permission to do so. I think, again, one of the things that will need to be developed to enable us to make the most use of Earth observation data going forward is the arrangements about at what point data can come, become available. How do we make sure that um, observation data is available to the right stakeholders at the right time in a way that allows protection of it where that is needed and access to it where that is a reasonable um, a reasonable thing to see. So you're completely right that uh, real-time data is not quite there yet. I think that we're going to see the, uh, development towards faster data availability, but there are a few hurdles to get through. I think what we would emphasize with this is the reason it's so important to move towards that access to data is because of the, the richness of insight that, that analysis can provide. I'll stop there, Leah. Great, thank you. Uh, Robert and Melanie, would you like to review the links that you put in the chat? I will let Melanie do that since she's much better at that than me. We don't have much of that. That's the thing. That's the problem we have to think about how the tuna requirement, basically fisheries management um, of tuna, uh, th those requirements are important to know from you guys because most of you are sitting in those management um, uh, organizations and, and probably you have seen that your teams are not that rapid jumping and doing all this, but because of lack of, you know, that, that capacity, I would say, to translate that data to some kind of product. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Melanie Abekasis and we just put a few links to um, the NOAA Coast Watch program which has uh, mostly satellite data, ocean satellite data, so those are very good sources. Um, all of the data is available publicly and for free and a lot of it is available in near real time, so hopefully that, that's helpful. And the erdap.com link that I put in there uh, also allows you to discover any kind of data that you might be interested in that would be available on ERDAP platforms that are really easy to use uh, to subset uh, data, visualize it, and download it. Great, thank you for sharing those links. Um, Patrick, would you care to share your perspectives and being able to use EO data for your models? Yeah, um, so a bit like uh, Coastal Watch uh, that uh, Melanie mentioned, the, in Europe there is uh, the Copernicus uh, program, which is a very ambitious program uh, with uh, marine components. So I, I've shown some some uh, output from that. Um, so you are, you can access publicly uh, uh, many uh, satellite or operational model uh, products in real time and uh, with reanalysis also. 
and that's that's quite e easy to access and and, and to use. Uh, but uh, uh, the the question that has been uh, raised is, is interesting. At at which uh, should should we uh, release publicly uh, all all the products that we we can derive from from that for uh, fisheries, for example? So uh, that, that's an interesting question that we we could discuss. Uh, so I think the the the, the idea with the, the European uh, program is to develop as far as possible uh, uh, many uh, pub, uh, to provide products that can uh, be used by uh, other uh, partners to develop uh, some some what they call uh, blue growth some, some business on that. And I guess we we need we still need to to define uh, what we should release publicly or not, especially with the the new product coming that can help to to uh, target some species. And so uh, the question to to provide this data to the the legal uh, fisheries and, and avoid uh, to uh, encourage IUU uh, is uh, still there, and and we need to to answer that. I think. Yeah, thank you for that perspective on um, how we could share this information. Robert, you uh, made a comment about privacy requirements in the three boat rule. Could you expand on that a little bit? Sure. I mean, a, a lot of the the vessel data, um, particularly through agreements in the RFMOs, that data can't be released to the public if it allows you to identify vessels that are fishing and and so the rule that's been established is if you have three vessels that are fishing in a given area then that data can be released as you reduced in spatial scale and temporal scale for the data that you want for your project more and more data gets filtered out because of that rule so annual aggregated data you can usually get fairly expensive coverage of the fleets whereas if you move down to a, a monthly one degree by one degree type a lot of the data has been censored. If, you, if you're interested in, in, in flag-specific type information, I should say. Thank you. Um, the floor is open to additional questions. I actually have a, a question. Go ahead. Um, and it's it's for Patrick and others because I think it's it's something that is looming for a lot of us, and this is the notion of making predictions for climate change for species and how we deal with the scale at which the IPCC makes predictions and how we downscale that to, to regional models. And, and I'd be interested to hear what Patrick's and others' thoughts are in relation to, to achieving that. Yeah. Uh can start. Uh, so we we, we use the CIPODI model to project the future of tuna stocks using this IPCC um, uh, forcings, different scenarios. What we have seen for the moment is we, 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 we have to deal with different issues. Uh, the first one is that uh, there are quite often uh, some bias in the forcing from these models. So we are now uh, trying to develop a, a project to, to uh, provide unbiased uh, forcings to run the model. Uh, then the uh, resolution is quite coarse and uh, the uncertainty also is, is, is uh, high. So that means we need to run uh, uh, to to get uh, to to get an idea of the uh, uncertainty on the outputs, we need to run on some simulation with uh, uh, simulation from multiple uh, models, uh, and, and that's the way we 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 are trying to 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 go. Um, but the, still, the 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 problem of of uh, applying this uh, model outputs to the regional level is is uh, 
not solved. There are still, I know there are some, some, uh, some way to downscale the atmospheric forcings, for example, to original domain. So we, that's something we should explore in, in, in the future, certainly. Alan, could you comment on FFA's approach to addressing climate change for fisheries management? Um, thanks, Lee. Um, we, the FFA, don't directly involve in uh, um, you know modeling and, and, and so forth uh, with regard to uh, climate change. We do rely on uh, the Secretary of the Pacific Community, who's our science provider, to undertake those kind of uh, modeling for us. However, uh, the outcomes of those uh, <clears throat> uh, modelings uh, would feed into our management practices, and that would help inform how do we, you know, our, our adaptation uh, strategies in terms of, you know, um, the movement of stocks and so forth. So um, um, the end product from those uh, um, um, research and modellings, um, um, we, we we use those to support uh, our members in terms of the adaptation to the to the impact of climate change. That's that's pretty much what I can say uh, on this topic. Great, thank you. It's interesting to see the dynamic between how the science in one organization gets then moved to the management strategies of another organization in the Pacific. Um, I was actually curious, um, Alan, if you could expand on the international partnerships that you have with Kiosk and um, this dark vessel detection system with Canada. Um, thanks. Uh, so yes, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Manu did alluded to in her presentation, we have uh, existing collaboration with the, the Korean uh, Institute of Science, uh, Ocean Science and Technology. This has been going on for a number of years. Uh, we started off uh, in 2016. Um, the, the focus uh, at that time was mainly on um, use of satellite Apache radar Im imagery, uh, mainly from uh, Sentinel-1 uh, um, um, constellation. Um, so there was quite a lot of uh, lessons learned out of this particular collaboration. Uh, in particular, um, the, the low coverage of Sentinel-1 um, in the Pacific region um but um uh, one of the, the benefits out of these collaborations uh, was that it did, it did enhance uh, the FFA's uh, understanding of you know the utilization of um, uh, satellite Apache radar and some of the related processes that goes with uh, uh, with that um right now we've uh, uh, we're working on uh, um, uh, finalizing um, a, a second version of the project uh, and uh, uh, this builds on uh, the project that we've done uh, with Kiosk in 2016, mainly uh, incorporating other, other remote sensing technologies such as you know, optical sensors and uh, visible infrared uh, imaging radio meter suite uh, and, and, and so forth. So uh, this is uh, uh, ongoing at the moment and it's about to be finalized uh, uh, and um, the project should, 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 should be underway. Um, on the, uh, the collaborations that we have with the uh, uh, Canada Department of Fisheries, uh, this is on a system called the Dark Vessel Detection. Um, this, uh, uh, this is a really interesting uh, uh, project um, in that um, uh, it, 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 it focuses very much on um, detection of vessels that are not reporting on any of uh, um, uh, the systems out there, such as in you know, a vessel monitoring system, EIS, and so forth. And this uses uh, remote sensing uh, data from, um, you know, VHF detections, uh, X-band detections, uh, also the use of visible infrared imaging, imaging uh, radio suite, uh, uh, radio suite, and also the use of optical through um, um, a, a satellite out there called the Hawk I360. So um, this is mainly um, a collaboration to um, to detect dark vessels uh, per se. 
uh, but it also helps to uh, validate our own vessel monitoring system and, and provides um, an enhanced uh, maritime domain awareness of you know activities within within, within the region. Um, so yeah, those are the two um, that, uh, that collaborations that we have that very much um, uh, links to um, um, EO. Thanks. Great, thank you. We have time for about one or two questions. Again, feel free to unmute your mic. Um, I will say that our first session covered climate change impacts on tuna fisheries. So if you'd like to see the recordings of the presentations from that or other sessions, please go on to our website. Um, I do have a question for either Robert or Amanda in terms of bycatch. Um, you mentioned, Robert, like there are different ways that you could suggest strategies based on what species that you're trying to protect. Um, but some of the challenges are then trying to predict how fishers will change their behavior. So how are there lessons learned from other regions that could help you predict um, how fishing activity will change or how do you then um, balance the needs for different protections for different species? So I think I think the first thing to keep in mind is to always try and work with the fish fishermen, the fishing industry to solve the problem first. I think the innovation, the, the ability of that industry to innovate is remarkable. And I think fostering those relationships to, to state what the objective is and, and trying to get it done is, is really important. Um, there are times when we cannot innovate our way out of it, and, and it's just a numbers game. We have species that are at critically low levels, and you know, incidental take is deeply concerning. When we move, when we have to move to closed areas or dynamic closed areas, um, if it's a highly mobile species, we we again have to do the work to try and understand what motivates the fishermen to fish where they fish. And I don't know if we've done enough work there. I don't know if we've worked close enough with the social scientists and the economists to have those models um, advanced enough to be able to answer those at the level specific to the fishery. But we do know they will redistribute. And, and there are ways to, to kind of make some simplifying assumptions to, to see where they will go. Um, so in terms of the modeling that, that we're doing, that's actually the stage that we are at right now, which is how do we, if we, if we close an area, how do we predict where the effort will go? How will it redistribute and and what are the consequences for the fishery itself in terms of target species but what are the unattended consequences for other species that we may be interested in protecting and that requires a lot of information that's that's a lot of species distribution modeling and and unless we have a lot of tagging data um, we can have some pretty biased pictures of, of the environment that species use so work with the fishermen first. Um, so Leah, I'll just add a couple of things to that, um, which is that I absolutely concur that uh, the fishermen are usually far more knowledgeable and inventive about some of these solutions than, than, than are credited, than they are credited as being. I also think though that there are, um, that not all situations are equal in this stuff. So there may be situations where we would say we need to prioritize um, independent data, non-fishery specific data to actually build a better picture and allow um, clear understanding of full range and interactions. And then there are other situations where relatively um, clear data can be found around things like spawning grounds and nursery areas, and there can be some sort of more basic fishery management decisions considered. Um, I think in the case of bycatch species, one of the largest challenges we've seen in an international setting is the lack of willingness to invest in collection of the data in a way that would actually allow the analysis that's needed. So I think there is always a mix of what's the sort of what we might call the 
in, in Western context, the no brainer action that you can take and do and where are there really gaps where the biggest need is actually the data. Because once you have that, you can start to, to build the analytical picture that gives you the insights you need. And at that point, the question isn't, is there a portal or technology, it's is there data? Just to build on that, um, Patrick, I'm curious how um, SPC interacts with social scientists or if there's any type of social science information that goes into the type of um, models that you produce. Uh, well, for the moment, um, not really. Uh, I guess what, what one thing I... Uh, we, we should probably uh, develop in, in, in the future is to uh, imagine uh, some uh, scenarios of uh, fishing. So that, that's implied to develop a socio uh, bioeconomic uh, modeling with uh, uh, fleet dynamics and, and include all the economical and social uh, aspects in, in, in this uh, work to, to be able to project future uh, uh, fishing effort that we don't know, of course. So that's probably something we we should uh, think about for the, the coming years, especially in the in the for when we are interested in the future of the stocks with climate change, or maybe not uh, for the next coming hundred years, but at least the the two decades that are the time scale, which is maybe the, the most useful for the management. Just, just want to add one thing before, I think uh, Odni have some, something uh, to add. Uh, I think mostly the socioeconomic is, is done at the, at the management evaluation strategy. So you have, that, that's where most, most what, what uh, fisheries management happened so far. So I would leave that. Yeah. Main yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just put management evaluation strategy. That's that's where mostly what we do. Uh, anyway, so Rodney maybe have something there. Spain. Um. So we are at the end of our session. I'll read Ronnie's comment real quick, but then I I do have to close. Um. So Ronnie said, um, let's see. In con oh, FFA works in conjunction with SPC to develop socioeconomic analyses that add on to or integrate some of the biological models that SPC develops. So again, going back to that partnership between the two organizations. Um, I do want to be respectful of our presentation presenters' time. Um, so I want to thank everyone for participating today. I think we've done, we've had a great discussion about some of the challenges and these upcoming tools using earth observations to address tuna fisheries management and fisheries management more broadly. So again, I thank all of our presenters and our participants, and I hope um, you have a good day or good night wherever you are. We will have these presentations and the recording on, available on our website next week. Um, so if you have any questions, please send an email, and we hope to see you at a future session. Thank yeah, you. Uh, just, just say a few words no. about the next sessions. I think the most of them are going to address the AU fishing and uh, mapping, habitat mapping. So, so those are, are a lot of relevance to, the, to this group as well. So, yeah, session four is on December 11th, and that's covering IUU fishing. And then session five, um, if I could pull up my computer real quick, it's the habitat. It's the habitat mapping and operational forecasting. That's correct, and that's going to be on December 15th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.